In this video, we're going to be discussing chemical weapons, corresponding to Goldfrank's chapter 126. The learning objectives for this session are that you'll be able to identify at least three classes of chemical warfare agents, including at least two chemicals that have a history of battlefield use, and to describe a treatment plan for those chemical weapons that have available antidotes. In case you're wondering, that symbol in the lower right is the insignia of the United States Army Chemical Corps, which has the motto, Elementus Regamus Proelium. We rule the battle through the elements. In most of clinical toxicology, we're looking at unintended consequences. The drug maker never intended anyone would overdose on their product, or we never wanted anyone to get harmed by this chemical or be exposed to this product. But it's all different with chemical weapons, because these are all agents specifically intended to kill, injure, or incapacitate. Chemical weapons are one part of WMD, weapons of mass destruction. The U.S. Army recognizes five classes of chemical warfare agents, and we'll be taking a tour through them over the next several slides. Starting off with the nerve agents. Nerve agents are potent organophosphorus compounds, which we've covered in our section about insecticides. In fact, the first nerve agents were developed by the German scientist Gerhard Schrader while working on insecticides in the 1930s and he got funding through the German government since his discovery had significant potential military impact. Before the end of World War II, Schrader's team had developed three nerve agents that they called Taban, Sarin, and Soman. As the Allies were liberating Europe, they discovered these nerve agents in the same order and designated them GA for German Agent A, then GB, and then GD. They skipped GC because GC was already being used as the designation for gonococcus, the bacterium causing gonorrhea. Shortly after the war, the British and Americans developed the even more potent VX, and it's believed the letter V stands for venom or venomous. Just as with the organophosphorus compound insecticides, nerve agent poisoning can be treated with anti-muscarinic drugs and oxymes. For convenience and ease of use with minimal training, Atropine and pralidoxime have been packaged into auto-injectors. The Mark I Nerve Agent Antidote Kit contains a 600 mg pralidoxime auto-injector and a 2 mg atropine auto-injector. Each individual is to be given three Mark I kits to carry if they're at risk of nerve agent exposure. The general dosing plan is for each individual to administer themselves one kit if they have more than mild symptoms of cholinergic toxicity. And if someone is severely poisoned and goes down, then their buddies are supposed to give all three of the kits the victim is carrying. If you recall, for oxymes to work, for them to kick the nerve agent out of acetylcholinesterase's active site and regenerate the enzyme, this has to happen before aging has occurred. For most organophosphate insecticides and most nerve agents, the aging process has a half-life of several hours, so there's some time after initial exposure to get the victim to more definitive medical care. However, Soman, nerve agent GD, has a very short aging half-life of about two to six minutes, and in a situation with mass casualties or the need for transport over any distance, it's likely that by the time a victim reaches more definitive medical care, all of their acetylcholinesterase enzyme will be irreversibly taken out. They're likely to need lots of ongoing care, probably on a ventilator, and this would likely not be feasible with mass casualties in a wartime setting. So, to avoid this debacle, you can pre-treat with pyridostigmine, as was done with U.S. troops during the Gulf War. Blister packs of pyridostigmine were distributed, and the troops ordered to take doses so that a portion of their acetylcholinesterase was occupied and inhibited by the carbamate drug. Most people should tolerate having about 30% of their acetylcholinesterase inhibited, which was the goal here, although there were plenty who experienced cramping and diarrhea or other cholinergic effects. Now, if those troops are then attacked with Soman, the Soman can bind up and inhibit the rest of the acetylcholinesterase and that person will go down. Then, there is likely to be some delay between the time of exposure and the time of being treated with oxymes, during which time the Soman enzyme complex has aged and that enzyme is irretrievable, it's gone for good. But then, when the victim is given pralidoxime, the pralidoxime easily displaces the pyridostigmine from the portion of the enzyme that remains and now you've recovered a substantial percent of the victim's original acetylcholinesterase activity, more than likely enough that they won't need intensive care level therapy. A very famous nerve agent incident occurred in the Tokyo subway system in 1995, when the Aum Shinrikyu apocalyptic cult released sarin. 
Fortunately, they did not use a very efficient dispersal system, which limited the number of deaths to 13. Basically, they put sarin in plastic bags, which were then wrapped in newspaper. They put these bundles on the floor of subway cars and poked them open with umbrellas, allowing the sarin to leak out, and then they walked away. Sarin is about as volatile as water, so it started slowly suffusing into the surrounding air. A more efficient dispersal system could have killed many hundreds or thousands, especially since a subway system has a relatively contained environment, being underground, without crosswinds, limitations to the ventilation system, etc. Even so, this was a mass casualty disaster, with several dozen more people admitted to the hospital, secondary symptomatic victims among the rescuers and healthcare providers, and a total of about 6,000 people seeking medical evaluation, with the great majority of those having no related signs of toxicity, but just being worried. Exposure to vesicants causes blistering, or vesication, of the skin and injury to mucous membranes. Here's a photo and two watercolor illustrations from World War I from sulfur mustard exposures. In the photograph, we see a long line of soldiers whose eyes were injured by sulfur mustard vapor, needing to hold on to the shoulders of the man ahead of them, literally the blind leading the blind. I used to think this was so sad that they were all permanently blinded. And while it certainly is sad to see them like this, the typical course was only temporary blindness, and their corneas would recover. But this shows the great power of sulfur mustard in causing casualties rather than only deaths. A dead soldier uses up very little supplies and effort compared to all of the time, effort, and care needed for an incapacitated soldier. So, from a military economic perspective, this result is ideal, and sulfur mustard was known as the king of the war gases. Sulfur mustard was first used on the battlefield in World War I, starting in 1917, and it had occasional uses after that, including the Iran-Iraq War in the 1980s. Much of our current medical understanding of sulfur mustard comes from that conflict. Sulfur mustard has a consistency like motor oil and is environmentally persistent. If you spread some around the battlefield, you can kill, or more likely disable, people who get exposed, but more importantly, you are denying your enemy free movement through the area until the mustard disperses, which can have a great tactical advantage. Initial contact with sulfur mustard is painless, but the chemical changes in the tissue start occurring quickly, and you have to decontaminate early even before symptoms occur or the damage will become inevitable. Sulfur mustard is an alkylating agent, a mechanism it shares with several cancer chemotherapy drugs, and it cross-links molecules, including DNA, leading to cell death after a short latent period. Lewisite is an arsenic-containing vesicant. It was developed for use in World War I, and they even developed an antidote for it, the chelating agent called British Anti-Lewisite, or Dimercaprol. Lewisite was never actually used in World War I, a shipment was made from the U.S. to Europe in 1918, but the war ended before it got there. And while many of the clinical effects from lewisite are the same as for sulfur mustard, lewisite causes irritation and pain immediately, while the symptoms from mustard are delayed. A few cyanides were used in World War I, but they weren't very effective because it's hard to achieve toxic concentrations in the air on the battlefield due to rapid dispersion and dilution in the air, the fact that HCN gas is lighter than air, so it drifts away upward, away from people on the ground, and because cyanide toxicity is much more of an all-or-nothing effect. Either you get a massive exposure, collapse and die right away, or you get a smaller exposure and recover pretty quickly. As opposed to, say, sulfur mustard or some pulmonary agents we'll get to shortly that incapacitate soldiers for many days or weeks, in which time they're chewing up military resources. But this isn't to say that cyanides have played no role in war. Off the battlefield, cyanides can be very effective in enclosed spaces where you can keep the concentration high. Hydrogen cyanide gas was produced from the fumigating agent Zyklon B and was used in gas chambers in Nazi extermination camps. That's a very dark chapter in the history of chemistry and toxicology. Chlorine and phosgene are pulmonary irritant gases, also covered elsewhere in this series, and they were used extensively in World War I. These gases cause a concentration and time of exposure dependent injury to the lungs and mucous membranes, potentially leading to pulmonary edema. Chlorine gas was used for the first mass chemical weapons attack in 1915 at the direction of famed chemist Fritz Haber, who is another part of dark historical chapters in chemistry and toxicology. He won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for creating the Haber process of fixing nitrogen to generate fertilizer, and he was also responsible for planning and carrying out poison gas attacks against troops, and even helped to develop Zyklon B, 
which was probably used to kill some of his relatives since he was a German Jew. Phosgene is not immediately irritating like chlorine, and it was reported to have a not entirely unpleasant smell of newly mown hay or green corn, so exposed soldiers might breathe in more before they were aware of it. Also, the pulmonary injury would be more delayed. A classic World War I Phosgene case might go like this. The soldier was in an area shelled with chemical weapons and noted the smell of phosgene. They would go to a medical aid station where they were checked out and looked fine, so they were returned to duty. Then, the next morning, they'd be found dead in the trenches with an effusion of pulmonary edema foam in their mouth. And our last chemical weapons category are the riot control agents, which continue to be used by law enforcement authorities. As the name suggests, these agents are used to cause people to disperse. A riot is too many people in a given area doing things you don't want them to do. But if you can get them to leave without using deadly force, wouldn't that be nice? So the defining feature of riot control agents is that they are very irritating to the eyes, nose, mouth, and lungs, and hopefully they are only irritating, having a high safety ratio, and do not cause more serious or lasting injury. All the victim needs to do is leave the area and they will recover. Riot control agents are often referred to as tear gas, but that's a misnomer. They aren't gases, but they are aerosols, suspensions of tiny solid or liquid particles in air. Personal protection devices that use some of these same chemicals, like pepper spray, might squirt out a liquid solution or suspension, but again, that's not a gas either. Serious injuries and even deaths have occurred from exposure to riot control agents, but this most typically occurs if the victim gets a very large exposure and is unable to remove themselves from the vicinity. For example, if they are locked in a jail cell. That's a misuse of riot control agents, since they are intended to convince people to leave. Well, that's my brief overview of chemical weapons. I've got a lot more I could say. I mean, gee, I wrote this chapter for the Goldfrank textbook. But instead, I'll be seeing you around.